Hey internet, I'm Simon Squibb, your host at the Good Luck Club podcast. Our mission is to help anybody out there that's thinking of starting a business do just that. Equally, if you've started a business and are struggling, maybe you need a little bit of inspiration and knowledge. And we hope by interviewing some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs and change makers that you'll get the knowledge you need to become the person you want and turn your business into that dream company. I personally have started 17 companies from scratch and have invested in over 65 startups. When I sat down and analyzed how I did it, I discovered a secret. It was all luck. I'm here to tell you, in my opinion, without luck, it ain't gonna work. Each week, I will discuss with my guests this theory and see if luck is a skill as I feel that it is. I hope you enjoy our episode this week. Welcome to the Good Luck Club podcast. My guest this week is Girish Jun Janwala, founder and CEO of Overlow Hotels. Girish, welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you here. I wonder if you could perhaps start off by telling our audience a little bit about yourself. Sure. So, um, Simon, as, as you know, I was born in Hong Kong. Um, Lived all my life here, except for high uh, university. I left Hong Kong, but I've been a Hong Konger all my life, and uh, started my life in the in the watch industry uh, back in um, 1984 when I graduated uh, from college and uh, went through the whole watch industry phase. That was a family business, and uh, grew that uh, to a sizable business. And in '97, I realized there's not much uh, there's not much future left in this business. Um, and for various reasons, uh, one of the main reasons was that I didn't see the new generation wearing watches anymore. And I said, it's time to get out of this business. And in 2002, I decided to switch off the watch business. And uh, I got into real estate with a focus on service departments. And then in 2010, um, I decided to venture into hotels. So a bit of pivoting around. Uh, and uh, here I am, a hotelier with uh, several hotels in Australia and Hong Kong, and now coming up in Bali too. Well, I've, I've known you um, 16 years and been witness to your um, rise in the hotel and service department business. And wow, you've completely changed the industry. You're so humble, I know, but I, I just want my audience to know just what an impact you've had on the industry and, and actually completely woken the industry up to doing things in a whole Thank new you. way. But we'll, we'll get into that later. I wonder if um, we could perhaps start the podcast off with you uh, mentioning maybe what success means <clears throat> to you. Well, you know, Simon, it's, it's, you know, when you start out your business, it's not, you know, people talk about passion, being passionate about business and everything else. You know, when you first, when I first started out my business, yeah, it was something I, I always wanted to change. I want to look at how things uh, were in the industry. I want to see what I can do with it. But in the initial phases of your business, uh, you know, it's not passion, it's all about survival. And, you know, when you pass a survival mode, does it really turn into a passion? So I said, you know, that's when you start saying, hey, you know what, this is something I really enjoy because you pass the stage of, you know, making ends meet and you're truly starting to enjoy your business. So I would say, you know, in a, in a, in a very sh- um, uh, short sentence is, is when a vision turns to reality and when execution takes place with the people you believe in the most. And that to me is success because having a vision without execution is hallucination in the words of, um, uh, I think it's James Edison. Uh, sorry, Edison, or was it uh, Einstein? One of them. Well, anyway. we'll make it your cl- your quote now. Yeah. We'll make it yours. Well, no, <laughs> no, no, one, no one will know. Yeah. <laughs> but vision without uh, execution is hallucination. I really like that because you can dream all you want to, but if you don't execute it, you don't get what you want. Is in your day just dreaming? Is you're not getting anywhere? So if you can get that down and start executing it, that's when things really start to happen. And um, I think that that's happened with us. You know, you had a, you have a vision and first thing is to get your people to buy into it and then start executing it. And, uh, and you know, you, you work through it as well and it starts to happen. You start seeing a product that starts taking place. 
I think that's such a great way of explaining success. And, and, and within, well, I mean, first of all, I want the audience to pick up on something that you've just said there. And I don't want it to get missed, which is this survival mode uh, piece, equaling, equaling passion. Because I was just watching a clip of Steve Jobs talking about, you know, how important passion is. I also say it myself. And I think a lot of people get confused that passion has to be necessarily there from day one. And I think what you're saying, which is which is an insight I want the audience to pick up on, is, you know, sometimes you build something, you execute, you make it real, you survive, and then over time you become passionate about it because it's 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 growing. Right? That's right. And I think I think that's yep. really that's really interesting because I think so many people want to start with passion because that's what they hear from Steve Jobs and me and others. <laughs> but actually, I think what you're saying is true. If I think back to my own career, sometimes it is about survival, and once it starts working, you can get really passionate about it. That's right. I mean, really you know, I, I still remember the early days when I started out. There was a time when I didn't have I didn't have enough money to pay my salaries, and uh, at that time, you're just thinking, "Damn, what the hell did I get into?" Mm. You know, I mean. Was this really worth it? I mean, you got three kids growing up, and uh, you don't have forget money to to do anything else. But you didn't have you didn't have money to pay your salaries, mm. and you know only when you get through that initial phases of business and you start to learn and you start to realize, do you say, hey, you know what? Yes, we did the right thing, and you know it took a little bit of time, took a little bit of patience, and yes, it's starting to work now. Mm. Yeah, I think. It's so important to have entrepreneurs like yourself come on and share their story because I think for so many people, they don't understand the pain. They think they just look at the success that you have today, Girish. They, they see someone like you up there, you know, entrepreneur of the year, hotelier of the year, you know, this success story, which you are. But they, they don't necessarily hear the point you're just talking about there where you, you know, you've put it all on the line. You've taken this massive risk. And I've had the same feeling when you're, oh, I, can't, I don't know if I'm going to make payroll at the end of the month. But I've had exactly the same feeling. And so there's almost like it's that risk that people don't understand you've had to take that your story kind of resonates with me quite deeply about that. And I want people again to pick up on it. But when, 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 you, started, um, when, when you started the business in 2002, the service department business, um, did you have a, did you had children at that point? You, yes, I had. Um, all, three children I at the point. Yes, yeah, all three were there and... Um, you know, they were, they were, I kind of got everybody involved. I mean, you know, one of the things I learned growing up, um, you know, when uh, my father's around, uh, my father's an entrepreneur too, and um, often the dinner discussions were, well, not often, all the time the dinner discussions was about his business. And he started to learn and he started saying, you know what, one day I'd like to be like him. I know he's, he is like a true hero to you because you know, he, he did all these things and he asked for your opinion and, and he'd do his own, th- he, he would still make his decision and, and go about it. So when I was starting out, uh, I saw my, my, um, so th- in 2003, my youngest one was nine and my oldest one was um, uh, 13, 14 years old. And they were actually helping me out because on Saturday, Sunday, I mean, you know, you, you're just starting a business, you needed all the help you could. And um, I did a bit of a, uh, kind of child labor and uh, mm-hmm. for them to work on weekends. And uh, they would be setting up the alarm clocks in the rooms. They'd be setting up the stereo system, you know, setting the, the TV channels. And I taught them all these things and, and they'd be doing it all. And they had to go through 40 rooms, you know, on, on weekends and just uh, set all these things up. And they learned as a process. I think they've become, they've also valued the fact that, you know, this is something that family goes through. It becomes a family thing. I mean, your family's behind you you have a lot more power that you say, hey, you know what, I'm going to keep going at it because they also believe in it. I think that's another thing, you know, I want the audience to pick up on this. A lot of my audience uh, are people that want to start businesses or, or have a business and, and sometimes it's strug- they struggle with it. And one of the big things I do hear of people not starting businesses is because they have a family already. And I think the mistake they make and the thing you're talk- talking about there, I think what I want people to get is that you should include your family in it and they're part of the process. You know, they're, they're, they're also taking a risk, right? So they should be involved. They're also part Absolutely. of it, and, and they learn so much. At 9 and 14, they can set the TV channels, as you say. Now, you could probably have hired someone to do that. There's also some, some <laughs> teaching in there, right? There's some teaching in that too, and making them appreciate what, what's going on. And, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, just, I just love this point. I think it's so important. Um, that you, you know, you started the business, you took a risk, even though you had children, you didn't let that stop you, and I think a lot of people do. And I understand why, because the responsibility is heavy. But equally, if you bring everyone in, like you're saying, I think it can be very rewarding. 
do, do they have the same story, That's I wonder? If, if, uh, if you ask them, they're like, oh, um, I was nine years old and I wanted to play with my friends yeah, and my dad yeah, made me go to the yeah, hotel yeah. and set the TV he, channel. He made us work, yeah. <laughs> what kind of father was he? Yeah, but um, I, I think maybe one day, I hope maybe 10, 20 years later, they, they speak about this experience that they went through. And um, I mean, to me, it was a true learning experience. When I was young, um, when I was working, when my father had his watch business and you know he had the factories and so on, and I was, I, you know, my father would make us work on weekends and uh, at an early age. And, you know, I, I went through the entire process of how a watch was made. I was sitting there putting the watch straps on, putting stuff on, doing this the whole assembly process that I learned so much from the whole process. Um, and this was almost every weekend in the summer. So, you know, we were, we were, you know, just a growing family and, you know, my father just learning through the whole ropes and, Learning all of these things taught me a lot. So when I went and set up a factory in China the first time, I mean, people told me, oh, they can only do, say, 200 or 250 uh, straps or, or doing this a, a day. I said, no, uh, uh, I've done more. I know how the process works. This is what you need to do. And, and when they saw that the, 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 the owner, the protagonist, knew what he was talking about, they didn't tend to believe with you more. So it's about just being able to do that. So I think when your, your kids have gone through the process, hey, you know what? This is what you need to go through. It carries a lot more weight. Totally. I, I was reading about your history, which is absolutely fascinating. I'm going to put all the links to your website and, and your businesses in, in this podcast uh, description. But, but I was looking in 1988 when you set up the factories in China, you were producing 500,000 watches per month. I mean, that's right. it, that, that's well, we intense. Went up, we um, went up to a million. Wow, that's just incredible. Yeah. That's just <laughs> incredible. But I, I, at what age do you, do you remember your first kind of uh, time working with your father? Can you? Do, what's your earliest memory around that? I actually never really worked with my father. So when I came and joined the business, uh, my father kind of left the business and he was looking after his investments more. And that's when I decided I wanted to join the business that he was kind of, you know, those, which was being neglected. And I came and joined the business. It was a, a watch manufacturing business. And I was very lucky when I joined it, it was going through a major transformation from the from the mechanical days to the quartz analog days. That was the days when Swatch just came around, you know, the, the colorful watches, the fun watches. And that's the time I joined. And so I kind of turned everything around and we got into this kind of business as well. And we set up our first factory in China in 1988. Um, and, uh, and we never looked back. So things went very well for us. We were producing at low cost and we could produce a volume we wanted. And um, it's only, you know, in 97, 98 when I started seeing that things are not going to be the same as it is. Now, when, when reading about you, um, you, you describe yourself as the black sheep of the family, which I find a fascinating description. Um, what, what makes you the black sheep of the family? Well, you know, um, <laughs> um, I was always the, the person who who defied everything. I would be the person who would say that, hey, you know what? If people take 60 days to do something, why can't we do it in 30? Anything because you can. I said, no, of course you can't. This is how we'll do it. I said, why are you trying to be this? Nobody needs that. I said, no, you can do much more. If you go do this, you can do a lot more. So whether it's in, in whether it's in the watch industry or in whatever we did, even when I entered the hotel industry, I said, listen, you know what? We have to do do something. So something different. So when you do something different, you automatically get the label of being the black sheep as something who's not doing with the norm. You're going against the norm and saying, I believe in there's a there's a different way of going and doing things. And that's what I just did. You- so all along I've done something that's a little bit different than what the industry wanted. Well, that's certainly true. When I look at the amazing work you've done with with the hotels uh, and even in the early days of the service departments, you really rocked the industry. But do you think you've got this from your father? I mean, your father left India in 1951 and moved to Hong Kong. That sounds like a big move. Do you think this is, you know, his his legacy, his training of you? It could be somewhat. Uh, I think it's a lot to do with the dinner table conversations that we used to have. Uh, the fact that I used to work for him on the weekends, uh, even when I was 13, 14 years old, 
I think that would just gave that feeling of you belong to a, an entrepreneurial business family. You know, when my father had left everything behind and he was kind of like a refugee in Hong Kong. And, you know, these people work very hard, uh, like my father worked very hard. And, and we went through the, the ups and downs of, of a normal family would. And I think, you know, when you just came out, you say, you know what, I, I, I'm going to do the same thing. I want to run my own business. I want to do it just like the way he did, because he did it with a, with a heart, with a passion. And, and he, he made it work. There was no, there was no chance of failure. Failure was not an option. You just had to work and keep doing it because there were ups and downs all along the way. But, you know, they'll, they'll be doubtful. But you know what? If you give up at that point, then you've, you've given up. You don't give up. You keep going at it because there's, there's a different way to look at things all the time. It's an interesting correlation between failure and risk. I mean, what, what's your view on that? I mean, is it, of course, there's, you've got to fail sometimes, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, if, you know, if you don't fall down, you don't get hurt, you don't learn. And you need to fall down. You need to get hurt and get up and keep going again. You don't fall down and say, no, I'm not going to get up again. That, that was a bad fall. No, you keep going at it. And uh, you learn from your mistakes. I mean, look, everybody makes mistakes. I've made plenty of mistakes. You learn from your mistakes and you keep going at it. I mean, when I look at your story, I, I actually don't see that many mistakes. <laughs> I mean, maybe on a micro level, but but as a business, I mean, I don't see any failures there. And and so, oh, you know, yeah, you know, when we do interviews, we're always talking about the, the good stuff, right? But there's there's still a lot of stuff behind that you don't see about, and you know, some of the struggles you face, whether it's with the banks or or trying to convince them that you know what, I'm switching from manufacturing to hospitality, and it's okay. Trust me, I know I can do it. He says, No, you're a factory guy. You don't know how to how to run uh, hotels or anything. So, you know, just making all, and that was, that was, these are tough times you had, right? I mean, when I still remember when I, when I went to my bank for, to the bank, for, to the first loan, and they, they exactly asked, I say, you in the hospitality business, I uh, sorry, you in the watches, manufacturing guy, you're, you have factories in China. What do you know about this? And you had to convince them, look, listen, I do think I know it because I know how this business can be turned around and so on. And that's, the biggest mistake you can make. You don't tell them you can turn things around. You tell them you know how to make it work and, and so on because they don't like to see things turning around because that's a risk for them. And in the, in the beginning, they ask you for all sorts of guarantees. I, I still remember I had to, you know, give my, my house as my, my personal guarantees and so on. And finally, I had to give my house as a guarantee uh, for the business. But so I had to put everything on, online just to make sure it works. So these are some of the, the, the risk you have to take. I think, I think there's another point want. there that people have to back themselves, right? I mean, sometimes there's a lot of people that pitch to investors or they, they do pitch to banks. And, and if the bank doesn't see that you're willing to uh, back yourself, you know, they can't back you, right? So you're, what you're highlighting there is that you had to put it all on the line. You had to risk it all because you knew you could do it. And that brings everyone else along for the ride, really, doesn't it? That's right. Do you think entrepreneurs are born or bred? One of my favorite questions. It's interesting. I think um, a bit of both. Look, you can, you can have the instincts to be an entrepreneur, uh, but you also learn along the way. So you have to have the, 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 the thing in you that you want to do something different. You want to go about it because I've met people who just do not want to. So are they, they're never going to be the entrepreneurs. So there has to be a want, there has to be a need. There has to be a, a, a kind of a, a selfish thing that I want to do something that's different. I want to do something. And with that, you will learn along the way, you know, and, um, uh, most entrepreneurs I know, I mean, have succeeded in some way or the other. I mean, uh, in different levels uh, in, of, of achievement, but they've, most of them made it because you have that desire, that want to do it. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting this work-life balance piece also comes into play, doesn't it, where there's an element of, I, I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, and I, I'm interested in your view in this, that, that don't make it, do try to have a work-life balance and separate out their work-life but in a way you were trained as an entrepreneur and because at lunch and at dinner at the table, you're talking about work, right? And that's kind of part of your life and who you are. 
So that put, I had the same experience, by the way, with my, I think that's why I'm mm. an entrepreneur. My parents are similar, similar experience, even with my son today, who's three, I'm including him yeah. in the podcast. Right. And I think that <laughs> that is part of it, right? That's the nurture versus the nature piece. Right. Right. But you know, this interesting, you bring up this work life balance. I often ask this question and, and, uh, when, when people come for interviews to me and say, uh, you know, this work life balancing and say, I said, so tell me one thing, is there, is there a formula that you follow? What is a formula for work-life balance? I, I mean, how many hours? Because to me, work is the ultimate pleasure. That is life for me. So I said it's different for each person. So is there a formula for each person? So how many hours do you want off? Do you mean that you don't want to look at emails on weekends? So if I have to look for you urgently, what do I do? Should I say, hey, you know what? I can't disturb you now. So these are the kind of people I'm very wary of because are you just looking for somewhere to come and park yourself and, you know, kind of go back home and get your little packet of salary and so on? No, then this is not the right place because we are very clear. You know, you either be a part of it, you're getting ingrained in it, and that's what we want. It's a very good point. Again, for anyone out there looking to hire people, I think it's it's quite tricky, this one, though, because if you want to hire an accountant, they might not necessarily, and not all accountants, but, you know, they might not necessarily be wanting to uh, take a phone call at four o'clock on a, on a Sunday, right? But it's your, it's your culture. So as, as an, an entrepreneurial culture that you're looking for people to buy into, right? But how do you get that balance? Balance of work life? When, when you hire people, how do you hire? Yeah. Because some people be scared by what you're saying. Well, yeah, I think you just have to find a free people. And look, the bean counters will always be the bean counters, right? I mean, uh, the job is numbers. Now, you don't need the number of people on the weekends or, or whatever it is or for whatever matter it is. You know, in my office, people are working until 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. You know, Hong Kong is a very high, you know, energy place as you've lived here, Simon. You know how it works in Hong Kong. But people are just very geared towards making things happen. And that's the kind of people you want. You just want to make things happen. And they get a self-achievement out of it as well. Like, you know, to see the achievement and to see the business growing and everything else. I think for my listeners in America and in, in England and Europe, you know, really you have to go to Hong Kong one time and experience what Girish was just mentioning oh, there. The energy, the work ethic. The, the, it, I learned to work when I, when I moved to Hong Kong. I, I thought I knew how to work hard as an entrepreneur when I lived in England. And then I lived in Hong Kong and it was a completely different level. And uh, the energy helps you do it in that city, right? But um, So I wonder if you could give an example when luck has played a role in your business life and perhaps when bad luck has played a role. Well, luck always plays a role uh, in many ways. You know, I think luck played along with gut instinct. Uh plays a very important role. Um, when I was looking at, uh, at my first property, I was, I, she was, my wife was looking for a restaurant space. And uh, she asked me to come along because it was on a street where I lived for my first 18 years of my life. And I went out and she, I went to look for it. And as we were coming out, we walked around the corner and I saw a for sale sign. So I asked the agent, I said, hey, is this space for sale? She says, no, 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 the building's for sale. I said, really? you got to be kidding me. And this was just towards the tail end of when I was thinking of shutting down my watch business. And really, one thing led to the other. I knew that space so well because I used to live right across the road from it. So I knew that place very well. And I said, you know what? I'm actually going to make a bid for it. I, I really liked it. And that's when the whole thing started. So I think it's, you know, that gut instinct, that luck that my wife wanted to see a restaurant space and I went along with her. So you know, with, with good luck and gut instinct, you double down, you go for it and you just keep going for it. And I think this is when you can weed off the bad luck. There will be bad luck along the way, but I think it's a good luck, the momentum you have with it that can fight off the bad luck that comes along. So it certainly helped in many ways. Um, when I was, um, I, I was, I've been in Hong Kong for, uh, my properties were in Hong Kong and um, I decided to open in Australia in 2013. And this was in Melbourne, just a small property and um, just to test it out. And we were going behind our, our biggest demographic, which was Australians in Hong Kong and said, let's go open in Australia. There must be something we do that I like. We opened in Australia, so we opened in Melbourne and that did very well. And so immediately I set my sights. I said, got to go to Sydney. 
So I went to Sydney and that was a pivotal moment for me. And uh, I, you know, from Melbourne, Sydney, I say, you know, if we go to Sydney, you got to have something by the water. And um, there are only three hotels by the water, by the way, in, in downtown in CBD. And uh, I found this property and um, um, lo and behold, the, 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 the owner was looking to sell. And there were two previous, I mean, the, the, the two owners. So the owner I bought from was Taj Hotels, which is a very large Indian chain. And before them was W, right? So for from 2000 up to 2015, for 15 years, this property never made money. But there's just something I saw that the gut just told me that this is right. Something feels right about it. But everything that was there at, at that time just not seem right. And I decided I want to go for it. And this is, again, the second, the second time the banks came by and said, wait a minute, the W could not do it. Taj Hotels could not do it. Who are you, right? You're over the hotels. You don't, guys don't know what you're doing. These are two major giants who know hotel business, and they could not make a single dollar in 14, 15 years. I said, because they did not know what they're doing. I think I, think I know what I can do with it. And, um, and they actually were very tough on me. And um, that is the second time when I had to practically lay everything down just to get the loans to buy the, the property. And I, I, I bought the property. And uh, one of the bankers who had backed out, uh, who did not lend me a knife and said, you know what, the day you make money on it, come back and see us. And after we acquired the property, it's not a single day we've lost money. And I went back to her and said, you know what? I've never lost money since the day we bought it because exactly we knew what to do with it. And that hotel has gone on to become Australia's number one hotel. And, you know, it's just about positioning. It's just about knowing what to do with it. So good luck with kind of the gut instinct, kind of work together and say, you know what? It can work. Yes, there were, there were a lot of challenges, I must say, but those challenges get overcome when you have the, when you have the notion that, you know what, it can work. You use, it just, something just tells you very strongly, your in, intuition tells, tells you that it's going to work and you go for it. There's something about the way you explain things, Girish, that makes me want to go to war for you. You know, like it's just that battle instinct, that, that rally cry and that against the odds thing that is the entrepreneurial dream. You know, for a lot of my listeners out there, they can absorb not only the words you're saying, but the energy you're pointing here to, to them too. I think this whole like, yes, it's, it's two big brands failed at doing it properly and, and, and you're going to do it right. It sounds arrogant, but it's not arrogance. It's passion that you've instilled once you started to make it work in Hong Kong in what you're doing. You've figured out the formula and, and you're revolutionizing the industry. And I also like the point, and I think this is why, no offense to any bankers out there, but bankers aren't generally entrepreneurs, right? I mean, they're backing entrepreneurs if they're smart enough to realize that they should. But you're highlighting another point there that these people who hold the money in this case aren't necessarily visionary. I mean, Steve Jobs talks many times, right, about how people thought Apple was going to fail and didn't back him and, you know. I think one of the, there was three co-founders of Apple. One of them dropped out, sold his shares 10% That's in right. Apple for 800 US dollars. It's now worth, you know, 100, 100, million, 100 yeah. billion or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. Um, but but you're, what you're talking about there is just so powerful. And I love this concept that you mentioned there as well, fighting off bad luck, which I've, I've not heard from people when talking about this concept of luck before. But really what you're talking about there is, you know, yes, you'll have moments where the banker says no, and that's a bit of bad luck if you position it wrong, but actually you fight through anyway and put it all online and make it work. So inspirational stuff. On the gut instinct side, I'd like to go a bit deeper on that. I mean, for a lot of people out there, they don't trust their gut or they don't listen to their gut. They try to listen to their head. How did you develop that gut instinct when you saw that property on the waterfront? You'd heard its history of not working under two respectable brands. How how did you know? Where did that gut instinct come from? Uh, where does gut instinct come That's a good question. I have no idea where it comes from, but I can just say one thing is uh you have to believe in yourself. You just have to know that if something makes sense, it will work because your bean counters. I mean, if I, if I ask my, 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 my money counters, 
about whether a deal is good or not, I would never be where I am because they'll tell me every deal is not good because they overanalyze everything. You don't need to overanalyze everything. Look, you know, sometimes when you look at something, you say, you know what? It's by the water. It's in CBD, right? It's been positioned wrong. But if they look at the numbers, they'll just say, no, hey, this is what it's been doing. What's it been operating at? This is how it is. It cannot do it. But you say, you know what? I'm going to reposition it. They don't understand the meaning of that, right? And only you can understand it and say, you know what? This can be done. You can, you can reposition the whole property and say to make it work. But the bean counters, the bankers don't understand that. You know, I often say bankers are come, come with blinkers on, you know, they can't look left or right. I mean, that's, that's the way they are. And that's their job, right? They're meant, they're, they're paid to analyze, they're paid to look at all these things. And they don't understand the fact that, you know, you say, you know what, I've got a business plan. I think it's going to be really good. And this and that and so on. Half the time they say, it's not going to work. Yeah. So many yeah. times you just have to believe you say, you know what, I think it's going to work because I know it's just, and you know, Simon, the, there, there could be times when you're wrong, but you know what? When your gut goes wrong, you make sure you get it right again and you keep at it to make sure to prove it that, you know what? You can do it. It, it can work. So there are times when it doesn't turn out to be exactly what it is, but then you work extra hard because then it becomes a personal thing. You know, you, you want to make sure that you can sleep well at night and say, you know what? I did the right thing. I, I remember a story you told me about how um, you used to go and ask your father questions and then um, he would always turn <coughs> that question back on you. So you would ask him and he would say, well, what do you think? And I, I wonder if that brought this gut instinct in, in, out in you that's so strong, you know, that, that inward questioning as opposed to the external answer that you know, most people get. When, I, when my son comes and asks me a question, I, I tend to give him the answer. But actually, since hearing your story about this in the past, I now actually ask him, what do you think the answer is? Do you think that's where your gut instinct has come from? It, it could be. You know, uh, you say this, and I, I probably do the same thing with my children. And when they ask me something, I've always got the answer for it. But I think that the thing that my father used to do was because I was so... Uh, I used to speak so much. I used to be very strong in, in what to say. And my father used to just, just listen to me and say, okay, so yeah, good. That's interesting. And why are you thinking of this way? Why, have you thought of anything else? I mean, how about this? Have you thought about this? I'd be like, why are you asking me that? When I've already told you what I, I think. Wow, you right? sound like my three-year-old, then, by the way. That's exactly how he responds yeah. to me. And then, and then you know, when you, you, when you went to it, well, three-year-old, I was like 20 years old. And when you went away, you'd think about it and say, you know what, are you here? She made sense. Um, the question you asked me, actually she makes sense? Uh, and you think about it because he threw that at you so that you don't leave any stone unturned. And, you know, because you, you know, we were just go-getters and sometimes you, you'd miss certain things that could be pitfalls. And that's where you start to start question yourself and say, hey, I mean, I've, I've looked at, at this, I've looked at that and so on. You looked at everything. So probably, yes, you're right. Maybe some of the, the gut instinct comes from them. Um, but it makes you question yourself, certainly. I think that's another good lesson for the listeners to pick up on. You know, if, you're, if you are a, a parent or, um, you know, even interacting with your own parents, having that self-answering detail piece, you know, some, sometimes the answers are, are, are in your own head. But I like the idea of that kind of pushback. Like, have you thought of everything, Girish? I like that. I think that gets people to push themselves to the next level, right? Oh, so yeah. It's, uh, mm. you know, it's uh, amazing. And this goes back to why I think nurture is so much involved in building an entrepreneur. I mean, no one's born a doctor, right? No one's born a lawyer. <laughs> you know, really? they, they, these okay. it's all part of the training, isn't it? So um, do, you, do you think you've had a big break in business? Do you think there was a moment? Uh, I think the big break, as I told you, was, was getting into Australia. Um, you know, that was kind of following my sense and saying, if you're demographic in Hong Kong, the largest demographic you have is Australians. You must be doing something right that Australians like. Maybe it's a free happy hour or the free mini bar or something, you know. <laughs> and uh, you say, you know what? It makes sense. Let's go where, you know, where the Australians are. And, and you open up in Australia and you start to dwell there. And I think so that was probably a big break, having to go there and to, to start your business. And now Australia is probably bigger than Hong Kong for us. 
And now we continue to follow our demographic and we've learned from that. So this is, this is probably something that there was sense more than gut instinct. Uh, it was sensible to do that. And we did that. Um, and uh, now we're opening up in Bali because Bali, the after Chinese, the largest travelers to, to Bali is Australians. So again, targeting a dem- demographic. I wonder, is there a, a mixing in lifestyle here? Because Bali, Australia and Hong Kong, probably three of my favorite places. So I'm in London right now, but I love London too, London yeah. is, but, but they're three of my favorite places. Is there a lifestyle decision based on this or is it all data? Oh, no, all data. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, for anyone that's not been to Bali, um, as soon as that hotel's opened up, Girish, we'll, we'll, <laughs> all the listeners and me would like to come <laughs> along and uh, yeah. You can be your mystery shopper or something. <laughs> but do you, how do you innovate though in, in, in the, you know, the crisis you've been through? I mean, you started the, the service department business in 2002. I mean, then we had SARS, right? I mean, that was a scary time in 2008 financial crisis. You were opening up hotels in 2010, you know, so it feels like you're kind of going against these, uh, these difficult moments somehow. So you, uh, how do we innovate? How do you innovate during those, those periods? How do you survive? Yeah, so, you know, um, I started, well, I started out, I actually started with real estate with a focus on service apartments. And in 2010, we pivoted to, to hotels uh, after the financial crisis. And um, so when I say real estate and hotels, we own every real estate the hotels are in. We own the real estate and we manage it, which is a very unusual model for hoteliers. You're either... The, the management company or you're the asset company, but here we are both. So it's very different. And I continue to enjoy this model. The people say it's too asset heavy. It doesn't matter. I'd rather go slow, but I want to get it, the, do it the way I think it's right. So I have to tell you, when I first started, when I got into the hotel business, I looked at it and I said, you know, all the hotels, you know, I thought about hotels and, you know, I looked at all the different hotel brands around the world and, and so on. And, you know, I, sure, there are many cool hotels around. When it came to hotels, we, we were very careful of, of what we were doing. We, we started looking at, at different hotel brands and so on. And we said, you know, a lot, there are a lot of cool brands out there, but they didn't necessarily provide the coolest experience. And, uh, it was just basically a transaction, you know, between, between two people. I mean, just, you know, you're buying a hotel bed and that's it and so on. And we wanted to be a, a brand that connects with the people emotionally. And I did not see that industry. And I went about putting my brand in a way that connects people to us. So we are in it for the long term. You know, where, where we did things that, uh, where, where people would appreciate what we are doing. You know, I do not like this fact that you no know, hotel brands were nickel and diming on customer when they walk through the door. You know, they're trying to upsell everything. You walked into your room, is like a 7-Eleven. You know, you can touch a water bottle because there's on little sensors that you get charged for. The mini bar, there's little price tags everywhere. The M&Ms were like eight times the price of, of what you could pick it up for. I just did not like that experience. It was unfriendly. You know, you've paid for the room. You enjoy the room. You should not have to think. It should be frictionless. It should be effortless. And that's how we went about it. You know, why do you have to pay for internet? That was at that time. You now, many hotels, yeah, in simple internet is free, but high-speed internet is not free. You pay for high-speed internet. Now, hey, today's world is all about video streaming and everything else. I mean, we're on a Zoom call right now. Now, you can't do it on a normal internet service. You need the high speed. Now, what are these guys thinking? Why are they still trying to nickel and dime you out of everything? So at Overlook Hotels, we decided we're going to do away with all of that. And we said, we're going to, you can understand what the customer wants. What is it that they are looking for? You know, when you walk into an Overlook Hotel, it should feel good. The music is good. The music is lively. It's all good 80s music. And you now you enter your room. It's not the usual beige and mahogany and, you know, that, that, you know, that typical room, you know, I, I always joke with people. I said, I will blindfold you, put you in a hotel room, 
take off your blindfold and say, guess which chain hotel you're in. And chances are you will not be able to guess because they all look the same, right? Now, you are not born to be this uniform, right? You are, you like different things. And that's what we provide. We provide that avenue. You're coming for two days. Why not experience something different, right? We were one of the first to have Apple TV, one of the first to have Alexa in every room. You know, it's just understanding the customer's needs and connecting with them emotionally, understanding what it is that they need. And sometimes you're providing them that they did not know what they needed and you also don't have it, right? And that's what we were about. So that's how we started the hotel business and that's how we took it forward. I actually think people like um, Amazon should be paying you money because I know a guest who stayed in your hotel, a friend of mine, who said they use Alexis and after that they went and bought one. So like you said, they didn't yeah. know they needed it. They had it in your room and then they liked it afterwards. So, But I think the whole model is interesting. I mean, you... It, I think for a lot of listeners, they also don't understand the model of hotels, how it's disconnected from the very beginning where it is, as you say, run by a brand but owned by someone else. And I think, like you say, the slow and steady model seems to be also an integrated model which allows you to think long term because a lot of those hotels are just trying to make money out of people, aren't they? That, that upgrade thing is just about making money. They take away what people actually need, give them the basics, and then they know they're going to make money out of them. But you're thinking much more long term, which must also scare bankers at the beginning. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's worked so, over time. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, t- tell me about your education a bit. I mean, I have a thing about education where I, I personally worry that it's, uh, it takes away from people's hunger. But what do you feel about your education and what's your opinion about education? Uh, I think it provides you with, uh, with, the, with the necessary uh, basic foundation for you to do what you have to do. Uh, I, I, I was, as you said, I was a black sheep. I was a black sheep in Hong Kong in school as well. I didn't do, any, I didn't do very well in school. And I, I was lucky I went away to college. But it's college that's changed me. And it's not college as in terms of the education, it's the people. It's the kind of people I met. And I, I learned a lot from those kind of people. Um, I just whiz by college. I, I kind of scraped through it. But I think it gave me the basic foundation of knowing what to do and how to go about it. And, and how do you network? How do you learn? How do you, how do you talk to people? What do you do? I mean, some of the best classes I had was actually public speaking, you know, running on business, entrepreneurship. I excelled in those things. I, I, I did pretty good at math as well, but that was pretty much it. Um, and I, it, was, it, was inter- it was interesting, but it gave you the basic foundation to know how to become an adult. From, from, from high school, you were going to college, you became an adult all of a sudden. You had to meet people and you, had to, you became the owner of what you had to do. So there's a big responsibility on your own by, by itself. I think it's an interesting insight. And one of the reasons I love to do this podcast is because I have an opinion and sometimes I share it, but I like getting other people's opinion around the same subject. So I left well, let's school. Let's hear your opinion. Well, I left school at 15 years old and I never looked back. And I, I didn't enjoy school. And I, 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 I had a similar experience to you in the sense that I started working and I started hanging out with people that had their own businesses and feeling inspired by them. And so, but I, but I see, for example, in today's education system, and this is particularly true in England um, and in America, students come out with so much debt now that they're scared. My niece, for example, she comes from an entrepreneurial family, and I know she listens to this podcast, so, you know, I love her very much, but she gets stuck in this trap, which, you know, she comes out with £60,000 worth of debt, and an education that's about the past and not about the future, and she can't start her own business because she's got to get a job to pay that debt down. So, you know, it, it, it kind of, and, and, and I mean, I also think entrepreneurs, we don't hire people based on their qualifications. I know you don't, right? So, but I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a tricky one. It's interesting to hear that you, you actually enjoyed college. And I think I'm talking about university more than basic school. I think basic school is yeah. a privilege. University, uh, yeah. But, you know, look, I, I scraped, I, I went through a four year course in two years. I was just in a rush to get out. Sounds like I, your whole I life. Just, get it up. Yeah, just, a hotel empire. I had to just pass and get out of it. Uh, I was actually going to leave halfway through, and uh, and um, my brother kind of knocked some sense to me. He says, "Look, listen, you're six months away from graduation. Why don't you finish?" And I said, "Yeah." And I started. I started a business when I was in college, and I was really excited by it. 
And he said, look, you can always do business the best way life. You got six more months, you get a degree. And honestly, I scraped through it. I, I, and came up with the, uh, you know, in America is 2.99 average, which is uh, GPA, which is fairly low, but uh, I made through it. But you know, the main, most important thing was I had fun. I, I met a lot of people. I enjoyed it. That, that vibe that was there in university, that was what I really enjoyed. And I, I it turned me around as, as a person. Do you, do you, um, your own kids now, which must be um, much more grown up. I mean, I know, I know your kids, uh, but they're, they're grown up now, nine and 14 at 2003. How old are the kids now? Do they all go to university? Oh, my eldest one is uh, 31. And, uh, uh, second one, Avisha is, uh, 27 and my son is 24. Wow. Are they all in the business? Um, my eldest one is the one you spoke with earlier, Avni. She's in the business. She's in the marketing department and the Brilliant other two marketing. are, yeah. 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 Well, thank you. She, she is good at what she does. She's very good. Very good. And, uh, my, my son and my daughter are doing their own business. So my daughter, second daughter is doing a fashion line. And uh, my son has started a video production company. I feel like we should <laughs> include them in the comments and give them a, a plug. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe should. <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, so that's interesting. I mean, from a from from a going forward perspective, I mean, do do you think education is the right thing for my listeners out there? I mean, it's it's it sounds. I mean, Steve Jobs dropped out, right? I mean, there's so many. Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard. He didn't finish and get his degree. He kind of went and did Microsoft, and we all know what happened after that. So there's a lot of stories of people that didn't push through like you did that still did quite well. But what, what do you think is the right answer in your, in your view? Um, I think it's important to get the basic foundation, right? But I would not overanalyze anything. Um, I often argue about the merits of doing an MBA and, and, and so on because you're made to analyze businesses and analyze and analyze. And many things don't rely on analysis. Uh, you know, you don't need to overanalyze everything because half the time you miss the, the most important things which are not in the analysis. So I, this is where I do not disagree with. I, I, I disagree with the, the higher education and so on. But I think to get a basic foundation, to meet people, to network with people, I think is a great thing uh, to, to continue to do that. Um, because it does give you the, the, the platform for you to engage with others. And that's important. Today is all about engaging and networking. I think um, in, a, in a small world twist, um, first of all, my wife's parents lived in the building next door, the first building you bought. They lived in the building next door on Arbonnet Road. Oh, okay. e- equally, um, I would have been uh, still in university, just coming out the other end. When I f- if I hadn't done my own business, I wouldn't have met you. So, uh, so it's funny, you know, network and meeting people and all that. There's many different ways to network and meet people. I, I, I met you because I wasn't in university and I, I got yes. to learn from you and, and work with you. And, and so it's an interesting take. Isn't it? Whatever our experience is in the past, if it's worked out for us, in some respects, we use that as a benchmark. But I, I think what you're saying, and I agree, is there's, there's no, there's no overanalyzing is a mistake, but education could be good for some people and not for others. I mean, ultimately, it's probably the right, right I agree. way. Yeah. Look, and, there's, no, there's no right or wrong. Um, but I'd say, do what you have to do. Mm. You know, if you have an idea, I mean, I started a business in college. Uh, nothing stopped me uh, from starting something. And you continue doing it. You, you learn from it. What was the business uh, in college, out of interest? Uh, you... I started two businesses, actually. Uh. One was selling T-shirts. And the other one was, I, I actually got into the watch business when I was oh, there. Okay. Yeah. I feel like, um, yeah, see, the entrepreneur in you, doesn't matter where you are, right? Uh, yeah, you know, you, you, I think this, this entrepreneurial itch start, starts at a very young age. Yeah. Uh, somebody just have this, you know, itch that I want to do what I have to do. And, you know, I don't want to talk. Yeah, I, you just want to go about it, do it your way and, and not have to talk to anyone about it. Fair. Yeah, sometimes you, you have to follow your own gut instinct, basically. Look, Girish, yeah. I, think, I, th- I th- thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I just want to end on a lighter note, really, after getting into some heavy subjects. Um, if you uh, went back to your younger self and gave some advice, what would it be? Uh, well, several advice. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I learned myself was uh, when you have a good idea, be patient. Um, g- Good novel ideas take time. 
um, especially if it's innovative, uh, it takes time for people to accept it. So be patient. If you believe in it, continue with it. Uh, don't procrastinate over a new idea. Uh, if you believe in something, go for it. Don't keep waiting for the next day to come or the next year to come and I'll do it six months later. No, don't procrastinate. Get on with it. Uh, be positive. Many times uh, you, 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 know, you get a downfall and you turn negative and you say, what the hell did I do? And you know, it was a waste of my time. No, no, be, be positive, stay positive because with positive come good things. So I guess uh, these are some of the things that I would, I would have uh, loved if somebody told me this when I was younger. <laughs> wow, well, I, I, I imagine a young Girish was pretty positive and uh, it sounds like you've learned to be patient. So I will just sum up what I've taken from your insights today. Sure. I, I think it, uh, work is the ultimate pleasure is kind of a T-shirt I want to get made up that everyone should wear. <laughs> I love it. I think the whole concept, a lot of people ask about brand. I love this kind of connect to people's emotion point that you're mentioning about brand. I think emotion is almost mm. taken out as a word when it comes to uh, the relationship between, I mean, hotel brands for me, I don't get much emotion from them generally, but I do, I do from your brand. I do get that. I love the whole thing about gut instinct and learning to listen to it and follow it no matter what other people tell you, that gut instinct, follow it. Um, I know it's not your saying, but I'm going to make it yours, uh, which is vision without execution is hallucination. So uh, givish <laughs> 2020 and a fight off bad luck. I think this is a really interesting element that you know, we all have bad luck. It's all part of it. And I think fighting it off and being patient, but going for it, risking it all and don't overanalyze are just some of the takeaways I've, I've had from today's talk with you, Givish. And I hope my audience has enjoyed the interview as much as I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Simon. Great. Thank you for listening to the Good Luck Club podcast. We know you have thousands of podcasts you could be listening to and you've chosen us. We, of course, feel lucky. If you want to hear more, please go to thegoodluckpod.com or go to any of our social media pages and share with us your views, your insights and any way that we can improve what we're doing to make it a better experience for you. We wish you the best of luck.